Okay, so peripheral nervous system is interesting because it's more accessible. Okay, so we have a greater opportunity maybe to build devices and test them sooner uh, with a higher throughput. And so we'll talk about the peripheral nerves and the diseases and the regeneration uh, strategies as well as the instrumentation. So the peripheral nervous system is everything that's not the central nervous system. Central nervous system is uh, the brain and spinal cord, everything downstream of the spinal cord, nerves going out to the muscles and coming in from the skin and so on, are the peripheral nervous system. Uh, as you know already, uh, a neuron consists of a cell body which has dendrites where incoming information is, uh, is received and an outgoing axon uh, and axon terminals that synapse on the next cell downstream. And it's coated by this myelin sheath uh, which uh, has properties that accelerate uh, conduction speed. So an axon in cross-section looks a bit, little bit like this. It's uh, got the actual uh, fiber coming from the cell and then it's coated with this uh, myelin structure which is actually created by a uh, support cell uh, called a Schwann cell. Uh, now there are both unmyelinated and myelinated fibers. Uh, vertebrates have both. Uh, unmyelinated fibers uh, tend to be smaller, slower, uh, used for tasks that are not as time sensitive. Uh, the myelinated ones uh, are, can be quite large, up to 22 microns thick, and they have this uh, thick uh, layer of fat around them. Um, and those are separated though by what are called nodes of Ranvier, where that insulating layer is broken up. And that, at each of those nodes, uh, which are spaced, uh, there's a high density of sodium and potassium channels that create and regenerate the action potential at each step along the way. Now this, this uh, prevents loss of the membrane potential. It also speeds conduction because by separating the charge across the membrane, uh, it actually reduces the capacitance of the axon. By reducing the capacitance of the axon, you reduce the time taken needed to charge up uh, the axon. And, and there, therefore, you accelerate the speed of conduction of the action potential down the... So, uh, Pretty amazing speeds can be achieved getting to more than 100 uh, meters uh, per second and that's particularly useful. We have very long axons that, for example, that go from our spinal cord all the way down uh, to our, our legs and, and those uh, are very uh, uh, important uh, in terms of maintaining balance. Uh, the way we maintain balance actually is our most time sensitive task and those are the most uh, heavily uh, myelinated fibers. They have rapid feedback to help uh, keep uh, your, uh, your posture. So what is an action potential? Well, it looks like this. It's got, it's a little blip, goes up, undershoots, and then returns back to normal. It lasts for about a millisecond. It's about 100 millivolts uh, uh, in amplitude. And it, in the peripheral nervous system, its goal is to get to the presynaptic terminal, release a neurotransmitter called acetylcholine, which then acts on postsynaptic receptors. The acetylcholine receptor, uh, when it binds acetylcholine, opens a pore that allows sodium ions to rush in. That depolarizes the cell, it allows calcium in, it allows muscle contraction to happen. Now if you notice, potassium also leaves. It's a non-selective cation channel. Uh, it doesn't flux calcium actually, but it does allow sodium and potassium to go through uh, equally. Now, um, those ions are going down their electrochemical gradients. And those gradients are set up in an energy intensive way. And this, uh, is the sodium potassium pump that sets up those gradients. It pumps uh, sodium out and it pumps sodium in. You get three sodiums out for every two potassiums in and it uses an ATPase for each one of those. It uses an ATP for each one of those cycles. So this is a huge uh, energetic cost to maintain these gradients, uh, but that creates the capability for uh, uh, dynamics. Uh, when the pore opens, these ions run down their gradients and that creates the depolarization that's needed to yeah, I'm uh, sorry, yeah, sodium's pumped out and potassium is pumped in. Okay. That creates a, a basal state where sodium is very low inside the cell and uh, potassium is high. And actually these numbers are pretty useful uh, to keep in mind. This helps it all make sense. Uh, we don't think in most cases it's important to memorize things. These are extremely helpful numbers to know though. Uh, all of neural and muscular and cardiac physiology makes a lot more sense if you know these numbers, okay? So I would actually recommend knowing these. Uh, potassium is high inside the cell. It's low outside, 140 versus 4 millimolar. Uh, 
Chloride, it's the opposite. Sodium, it's the opposite. Calcium, there's a huge gradient. Actually, um, this is a typo though. This should be 0.1 micromolar or about 100 nanomolar uh, inside, but still very low. So that should be a micromolar instead of a nanomolar. But it's about 1.6 millimolar outside. So you have a very, very remarkable uh, calcium uh, gradient as well. And the, um, what's called the reversal potential for an ion is the membrane potential at which if there were an open pore, there would be no net movement of the ion. That's the reversal potential indicated as E. And you can calculate that with something called the Nernst equation. And so uh, what this captures is the fact that there's an electrochemical gradient. If there's a, a chemical gradient, a higher concentration on one side than the other, the ion will tend to run down its concentration gradient unless there's an opposing electrical gradient. And so inside of the cell is typically very negative. That's in part set up by this uh, ATPase. And so that's gonna balance at some point with the chemical gradient. You'll have this uh, integrative uh, electrochemical gradient. And you can calculate the reversal potential. Uh, there's an RT factor, the uh, R constant, uh, T absolute temperature, and Z is the charge of the ion, and F is the Faraday constant. And the natural log of the concentration of the ion outside compared to the ion inside gives you its a reversal potential. So useful numbers uh, to know. So how, did, how does this then turn into an action potential? Well, this is classic work uh, dating back to Hodgkin and Huxley in the uh, 50s and 60s. They did experiments with the squid giant axon where they uh, were able to control or clamp membrane voltage and see what happened to ion flow at different uh, membrane potential. And you could do things like uh, delivering a 20 millivolt step, voltage step to the inside of an axon. Now normally, uh, if you do that, what happens is there's your initial step and then the action potential will take off after that. You'll have a responsive further depolarization or membrane potential change that happens as a result of your initial trigger. And so that gives rise to an action potential. Now, why does that happen? Well, because there's ion flow that happens and because ion channels are voltage dependent. They're molecularly set up to be uh, voltage dependent in how they open and close. And so that initial voltage step that the experimenter is giving uh, then creates this influx of sodium through voltage gated sodium channels. And uh, that uh, reaches a peak and then sodium channels have fast inactivation that happens and they start to turn off uh, and that terminates the flow of sodium. But you also notice something happening with a slight delay. There's a potassium flux as well, and that's happening because this rise in membrane voltage that's driven in part by the sodium is then opening slightly slower, but still pretty fast, voltage-dependent potassium channels. When they open, uh, potassium starts to leave, and that has a countervailing influence, and that helps bring the membrane uh, voltage back to its uh, negative or hyperpolarized uh, state. And so that's, that's the action potential, mostly controlled by sodium and potassium. Some tissues like heart and in some neurons, uh, a flow of calcium supports the overall sodium uh, effect and you have even calcium dependent action potentials. The directionality and the logic is the same. They're voltage dependent calcium channels which serve that function. So that's your action potential and then uh, if Zooming back out to look at the intact uh, uh, axon state, you have these uh, uh, sodium and potassium channel uh, clusters that lead to the initiation of action potentials. And then in a myelinated uh, axon, you have that only operative at these nodes. Uh, everything else is completely insulated. You have very low capacitance here. The action potential zips down here with no loss, very high speed. Uh, but there's a little bit of loss, and so the action potential gets regenerated at these uh, nodes. End result is you got an action potential or spike that hits the presynaptic terminal. And here you have vesicles containing acetylcholine that are primed and ready to go, and there are voltage-dependent calcium channels that sense that action potential that comes down and hits the terminal. They open, release calcium. Calcium comes in activates fusion of the vesicle with the presynaptic membrane. And the guy who figured this out, Tom Sudhoff, here at Stanford, just won the Nobel Prize for that last year for, for, for sorting all that out. And uh, that leads to release of neurotransmitter into the presynaptic cleft where it diffuses across, activates the postsynaptic receptors.
and those then uh, allow uh, sodium and potassium and also indirectly calcium to come in and that triggers muscle contraction. We'll talk more about muscle contraction. That's the basics of the peripheral nervous system uh, um, axonal uh, firing and we'll talk about how to modulate that and how it goes wrong in disease states. 